Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. Well, it is time for us to gather around the table of truth and the fellowship in the word of God. I'm excited. God has laid on my heart a new series that we're moving into, and I know you're excited about it as well. It's good to know that God is continuing to unveil and unfold to us revelation knowledge. That is the unveiling of the scriptures. He's given us knowledge, wisdom, and understanding so we can grow in our faith, so that we can be fully equipped, so that we can do the will of God, and so that we can be a light in this world. God has just not given us knowledge to be puffed up, but knowledge so that we can impart it, not only through our lives, but also through the communication of the gospel. Well, let us pray and go right into our lesson. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ and his righteousness. We thank you that he is Lord. We thank you that he is master. And we do honor your name for giving us such a great savior. Thank you for giving us the light of truth in a dark world, Father, so that we can know you and that we can make you known through Jesus Christ. We ask that you bless our time together in the word, Father. Give us an understanding heart. Let the word fall upon good ground that we may bring forth fruitfulness for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, like I said, I'm excited about a new series we're going into, and our topic is going to be Unity with Purpose. In Matthew chapter 20, uh, 12, go ahead and turn there with me in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 12, Jesus made a statement relative to unity. And it says this in Matthew 12, 25, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. As always, I tried to give us a working definition that we can use to keep us on course as we deal with this particular subject. Unity is one of those words like submission. It's kind of thrown out there and people want to use it in a way sometimes to control people. People want to use it in order to get people to compromise. But I'm coming from a biblical viewpoint. I'm coming from the standpoint of we that are called into the kingdom of God to represent Jesus Christ and understanding what true unity look like. And so a definition that I'm using for this teaching is the ability to identify and declare kingdom authority with a shared or united heart of faith that ushers in God's power in prevailing over an inferior kingdom authority. This series of biblical insight is one of those fastening your seatbelts and not because of caution, but because of the commitment that is necessary in order to fulfill God's purpose when it comes to unity with purpose. This safety feature that I'm using is required or requested in most of the movement that we have in our world today, be it in an automobile or airplane, they tell us to fasten your seatbelt. Well, I want to look at it from a spiritual standpoint, and that is to set your heart that you're going to commit yourself to the necessary discipline in order to operate in God's unity with purpose. As I often say, when we come to the word of God, we want to come with faith. We want to come with lens of faith and not with lens of religion or traditions of men so that we can fully understand what God is speaking to the church. In 1 Corinthians 3 and 9, the Apostle Paul said this, For we are God's fellow workers, his servants working together. You are God's cultivated field, his God, his vineyard, uh, his vineyard, God's building. Now notice, the Bible lets us know as the body of Christ. And, 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 and I'm like the Apostle Paul and the apostles in the Bible, and you, I know you are as well. We love the church. Now, when I say we love the church, I'm not talking about a physical building. I'm not talking about a denomination. I'm talking about the body of Christ. We love the body of Christ. I don't see how you could be part of the body of Christ and don't love the body of Christ. It's a wonderful body that God has united together. And we're going to look at that in some other lessons, how that looks relative to the church. But in Ephesians chapter 4, 16, the Bible says, from him, Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part works together. What is the writers of saying? The writers are saying that first of all, when it comes to unity with purpose, it's something that God does. 
We are united together in Christ. Christ unifies us. That's why when we get in the word of God, the word of God brings us together. The word of God is where we unite together. We agree with God's word. Amos 3, 3 say, how can two walk together lest they first purpose or they agree that what? We're going in the same direction. And I hope you are committed to going in the direction of God's word. So God unifies us or unifies the church. But get this now, you and I as believers, we undergird the church. That means that unity that God has already placed in the church, we endeavor to maintain the unity of the spirit. That's why you don't want to be a part of anything that tries to bring division in an institution that God has already unified. Matter of fact, in John chapter 17, we call it the priestly prayer of Jesus. Jesus prayed for the oneness of the believer. And that out of that oneness, we will give witness to the world of the word of God. And so Jesus unites the church undergirds, but love builds. Hallelujah. Love builds. The church is built upon the love of God. Now, in our foundational scripture, which will be Matthew 12, 25, we also witness this uh, uh, time where Jesus spoke this particular parable using this metaphor uh, in Mark chapter 3, verse 24 and 26. And the writer of Luke also penned it in Luke 11, 17 through 18. Now, contextually, Jesus makes this statement about the potential of division and the purpose of unity in the context of unity being seen as a weapon in spiritual warfare. It will determine the strength in the success of victory or defeat in a kingdom that is spiritual in nature, that's why we call it spiritual warfare, in a city that is in a social or political in nature, and are a family that is household or relationship in nature. It takes the unity of the Spirit of God to be able to cause those who represent His kingdom to operate in such a way that we reflect the very nature of God. And so in Matthew 12, 25, the issue here is the works inspired by God in the works inspired by Satan. That's what's going on in this context. The Pharisees attributed the works inspired by God to Satan's kingdom. This led Jesus to further explain how the power of a united kingdom works. Whichever kingdom is at work, the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness, they, and I want you to write this down, they work in harmony with their nature. Let me say that again. They work in harmony with their nature. It is impossible for these two opposing kingdoms to function in unity. Their very natures are in, natures are in opposition with each other. This is why the apostle John instructed the believers to test the spirit. In 1 John 4 and 1, the scripture says, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits and to see whether they are from God. Now, now notice what he said, test the spirits, plural. Why are you testing? To see whether or not this is the spirit of God. Is this from God's nature? Because if it's not from God's nature, or his kingdom is from another kingdom in the nature of that kingdom. In John 6, 63, when Jesus began to give revelation knowledge unto those who were following him, they enjoyed the natural provision of free food, feeding over 5,000. They enjoyed the miracles, but those were only designed to grab their heart 
to have faith in the word. And so when Jesus began then to declare that he was the living bread that came down from heaven, they could only, out of their religious lens, reflect on the bread that Moses gave them. Jesus said, and I'm paraphrasing, that's, that's not the bread from heaven. Hallelujah. Jesus is the bread that God has sent down. He's the bread of life. He's the bread of eternal life. And they couldn't handle it. And so they turned back. Their hearts were really not following Jesus anyway. Jesus had said they're following me basically because of the signs and wonders. They're following me because of what they can experience in their flesh. So in John 6, 63, Jesus said this. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit in life. Jesus made a distinction between that which is of the flesh and that which is of the spirit. So when we test the spirit, we have to test the spirit with the revelation of God's word. We test the spirit by being able to see what is the nature, what is being announced, what is being proclaimed. How does that align with the word of God? And in Galatians 5, 17, the Bible says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary. That means they oppose one another. They are in conflict with one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. That's why we want believers to be strong in the word and strong in faith, so that they don't have to follow the, the rule of the flesh. They can be led by their born again spirit. And in Luke chapter 9, 54 through 56 is a good example of this when Jesus was going through Samaritan and the Samaritans began to reject him. And Jesus' disciples, James and John, the inner circle we often call them, listen to what they say. And when his disciples, James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and to consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. What is Jesus revealing? Jesus is showing the tendency of those who follow him can have the tendency to yield over to the flesh and begin to operate in a manner that does not reflect his nature. And that's what James and John were doing. They were not being influenced by the nature of God. They were not being influenced by the kingdom of God. They were being influenced by the kingdom of darkness. These two kingdoms that Jesus bring out in the text, they work in harmony with their nature. So what do we have to do? We have to be able to discern what is of God and what is not of God. Where does that begin? When you get born again and when you begin to be discipled in the things of God. Discipleship is about being able to develop the knowledge in the arena of our minds so we can know and understand what is of God. What, is, what does God approve of? In Romans 12, 2, the scripture says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You really can't find the will of God for your life until you begin to allow the word of God to renew your mind. And so often believers, they are walking after the prince of the air under the influence of the God of this world and yet saying, I want to know the will of God for my life. The will of God for your life begins when you have understanding of that God has called you into his kingdom. That is, you get born again. And once you and I get born again and we start learning what it means to serve God, submit to God, submit to spiritual leadership in the church, studying the word of God, growing up in the things of God, you're going to find the will of God for your life. 
You're going to land in a place in your life where you're going to look up and say, I am in the place of God. And regardless of what you went through to get to that point, you don't hold no grudge. You're like Joseph. You're able to forgive people who tried to do things to you in, on your way. You know, you, 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 you're you able to forgive them because you know you're in the will of God for your life. So it begins with getting in the word and get born again. Get my mind filled with the knowledge of God's word. Another way is in Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. I want you to listen to this because this is very important. It says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Remember, we're talking about what? In every kingdom, there are th these two natures in these two kingdoms. Uh, they do not work in harmony with one another. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light have two different natures. And so we don't look to have unity with kingdom of darkness and kingdom of light. When it comes to spiritual warfare, you got to understand there are two opposing kingdoms. And so here the writer of Hebrews says that these believers should have been much further on the development of their faith. They should have been much further in being able to have their mind renewed with the word of God. But they have allowed the enemy uh, through being dull of hearing. In other words, they hear the word, but it doesn't transform them. They hear the word, but it doesn't bring any change in their life. They hear the word, but they don't grab fruitfully. I mean, they don't produce any spiritual fruit in their life. And that's a dangerous place to be. Because when you're dull of hearing, you can be easily deceived. Been going to church all your life, but no change. Been going to church all your life and don't have a basic foundation of understanding biblical things. And I'm not saying that to put you down. I'm saying that to challenge you. Get in a place where you can grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Get in your word. Begin to study. Begin to meditate. Begin to memorize. Begin to walk with God. But the writer goes on in Hebrews after he kind of somewhat rebuked those individuals who should have been much further on in their spiritual walk. He said in the next verse, Hebrews 5.13, for everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant, a babe. Now you know when a newborn babe comes into the world, that babe needs milk. Matter of fact, that's all the baby can drink at that point. But that baby does not stay on milk. That baby transitions beyond milk. And Paul just, I mean not Paul, but the writer of Hebrew just uses it as a metaphor to try to bring out a spiritual point. And the point is this. God wants us to mature in the things of God, in the word of God, in spiritual matters of our life so that we can be able to discern what is of God and what is not of God. What is of God nature and what is not of God's nature. What is of God's kingdom and what is of that opposing kingdom which Satan is the king of that kingdom. Well, in, in Hebrews 5.14, he comes to a conclusion. He says this, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Notice, solid food. He's talking about the meat of the word. He's talking about the spiritual things of God's kingdom. He's talking about what I'm teaching now, about unity with purpose, and it's in the context of spiritual warfare. Unity is a powerful weapon in spiritual warfare. And so he tells us it has to be constant use. We're being trained so that we can distinguish what is good and what is evil. The second thing, if we look at Matthew 12, after he talks in verse number 25, the writer said in verse 26, if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? In other words, they are present with us. You know, Jesus performs this miracle in verse 22. He basically delivers a person that was brought to him from demon power, from demonic powers. What was that? It was a kingdom ruling in that person's heart, a kingdom of darkness. And Jesus set him free. And there were some physical symptoms too, which was blindness and muteness. He couldn't speak, he couldn't see. But the Bible identified in verse 22, there was a demon behind all of that. Jesus discerned that. And he set him free. And the Pharisees 
said he cast out demons. Now, you know, they had to have some openness to spiritual matters of the supernatural. And they did. Based on their teachings in Judaism, they, they didn't reject the supernatural. They didn't even reject the fact that there would be a resurrection. The Sadducees did, but the Pharisees were more open. But they were blind by religion. They were blind by spiritual ignorance. They were blind by the law. Here the word is right in front of them and they are fighting against the word and usually when people fight against the word it's because there's another kingdom that has blinded them. The Bible called it the God of this world have blinded, blinded people, blind their heart, blind their minds to the revelation of Jesus Christ. So they both are present with us. And in verse 27 it says, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. In verse 28, but if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. This is Jesus' response to what I had just said, taught in verse 22, in the reaction of the Pharisees. And then now he responds, and Jesus reveals or informs us that another kingdom is present in the earth. The kingdom of God, but there's also the kingdom of darkness present. Has it ever dawned on you as people often pray what we call the model prayer, that God has answered that prayer? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus said the mere fact that I am destroying the works of the devil, I am casting the devil out of people's lives, I'm setting the captives free, I'm opening blinded eyes, the gospel is being preached, the kingdom is here. The kingdom is present with us. And Jesus is demonstrating what this kingdom looks like in the context of spiritual warfare. Now, the kingdom of darkness is here as well. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, listen to this. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Notice, he can only blind the mind of those who are not believers. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. And so here Jesus, he not only reveals the presence of two kingdoms in the earth, but he prophesied in verse 27 that generations to come are going to operate with the kingdom power. And they're going to understand that the power of the unity, because what? Because division weakens a kingdom. Division weakens a city. Division weakens a family. And so Jesus even said, if Satan was divided. If he operated in division, his kingdom would not be able to stand. His kingdom could not have power. And so what happens? When division comes, it weakens a kingdom. And now that kingdom becomes more vulnerable to outside forces. Becomes more vulnerable to attacks of the enemy. In our world today, the social and political climate of our nation, because of division, and some people like division, you can disagree, but you don't have to come to a place where you become such a divided nation until you literally hate one another, till you literally desire harm to one another and now what happens? Your enemies are watching. And at some point, they're going to know that you have been weakened. And therefore, when your enemies come to attack, you don't have the strength of the ability you once had because of what? Division. Same thing in a family. When there's division in a family, in a household, it weakens the potential of that family. It weakens the ability of that family 
to stand against the opposing forces. And so Jesus reveals that both kingdoms are present with us. And the last thing I notice about this that Jesus instructs relative to the spiritual weapon and spiritual warfare of unity is that they are not equal in power. And I believe that's where Jesus wanted to get his audience to the point of understanding that yes, there is a kingdom that opposes another kingdom. There's a kingdom of darkness and there's a kingdom of light. There's a kingdom that has a nature that is totally opposite of the nature of the other kingdom. They're both the present, but they are not equal in power. In verse 29, he says, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Two kingdoms with opposing natures both present on the earth scene, but yet one is greater in power than the other. In other words, they are not equal in power. In Genesis 3.15, after the fall of man due to rebellion, sin, the Bible says in verse 15 of Genesis 3, God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. First John 3 and 8 stated it like this. For this purpose, the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. I want us to listen to what Jesus is saying because Jesus is not denying that there's another kingdom present. But he's revealing that there is a kingdom present whose power is not equal to the other kingdom, but is greater. Therefore, Jesus is revealing to them that I have ushered in a kingdom with power. And that power is a kingdom that has a mission and a purpose. And that mission is to cause the works of God to be manifested in earth. And that mission is to destroy the works of the devil. And here's the question. Are we going to believe Jesus? Are we going to take Jesus at his word? Because if we take him at his word, we have the witness of the manifestation of his power. Matter of fact, in Luke's gospel, if you look back at chapter 9, I mean Matthew chapter 9, here's a great example of this. How when a stronger man shows up, how we're to respond. In Matthew 9, verse 27, the Bible says, When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. They're following him. They're not letting anyone stop them. They may be blind, but they know there is someone that has the answer to our problem. There is a kingdom that has shown up. There is a kingdom that has power. And the Bible goes on to say in verse 28, And Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. In other words, Jesus simply said, do you believe that I have the authority and power to change your condition? Do you believe another kingdom has come on the scene? Yes, Lord. Listen to what happens in verse 29. Then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be done unto you. 
That's how the kingdom works. He has the power, but it takes faith to experience that power. He has the power, but are we willing to follow him? He has the power, but are we willing to persevere? He has the power, but are we willing to get close to him? He has the power, but are we willing to communicate with him? He has the power, but are we willing to believe him? And they did. And the Bible say, and their eyes were open. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, see that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. They were so excited because they tapped into the kingdom that has greater power than the kingdom that had them by, by bound. They were bound by a kingdom, but there's another kingdom that has come into the earth and that kingdom has greater power. And that's what Jesus is saying to the audience. That's what Jesus is saying relative to these kingdoms. He is not denying that the kingdom of darkness is not present. He's not saying that the kingdom of darkness is not here. He's saying the kingdom of darkness is here, but there's a stronger man that has entered the scene, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus have come with a greater kingdom, a greater power. And so here we are, understanding that unity with purpose is about a kingdom authority. It's about a kingdom authority that we put our faith and our confidence and our hope and our trust in. That regardless of this other kingdom, that is an, an inferior kingdom. It does not have dominion over the kingdom that Jesus Christ have brought on the scene. So Jesus reveals what unity with purpose looks like in the context of spiritual warfare. Two kingdoms working in harmony with their nature. Two kingdoms being present with us today. Two kingdoms that are not equal in power. I have a few faith action questions. Notice I say faith action, how to put my faith in action. Faith that our works is dead. The first question is, how can you become more aware and more active in your faith against God's opposing kingdom. You know, the Pharisees were very religious, but they didn't understand the kingdom. And religion is something that can blind people to understanding God's kingdom. We have to be intentional that we're going to position ourselves so that we can be more aware and more active in our faith against God's opposing kingdom. The other question is what door or plural doors may you need to close in order to disallow the kingdom of darkness from obstructing your light? See, if you're in the kingdom of God, you're in a kingdom of light. That light represents truth. Truth that brings transformation or change in our lives. But sometimes we can give place to the devil. We can open a door in a sense that he tries to obstruct our light. That's why Jesus instructs us in the gospel. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. The last question is, how can you enrich other believers to the power source of your life supply? You and I need to be intentional about letting individuals know who supplies the power to our lives. Who gives us the ability? Who gives us the strength? Who gives us the wisdom? Who gives us the grace? Who gives us the ability to endure? Hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It's the spirit of God. It's the word of God. It's our prayer life. It's us reading the word of God and being able to speak forth that word in our lives. Not walking after the feelings of our flesh, but being led by the spirit of God. 
I'm excited about this journey that you and I are on. Unity with purpose. There's a purpose for unity. There's a mission before us. There's a work to be done. There's something much bigger, much greater than us that God has ushered into the earth. It's a kingdom. And he wants his children to occupy until he returns. Well, God bless you and have a great day in Jesus' name.